Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Peace Center. My name is Sue Skirman. I'm the outreach coordinator here. Uh, welcome to the UN International Day of Peace. Before we get started, I'm just here to welcome you all and to go over a few logistics. Uh, if this is your first time here, we've got two exits, the front door and the back door. We have two bathrooms, a big one and a little one by the back door, really easy to find. Um, if you could please turn off your cell phone, that would be helpful. Uh, this is kind of a special day. Uh, this is our second time that we've celebrated UN International Day of Peace. We did it last year and now we're doing it again, this time with a little bit more planning. And I want to thank the people that organized it. They've been meeting for, for months, and so we want to recognize them. It's, the, uh, it's, a, it's a collaboration, really, between three groups, uh, the Albuquerque Center for Peace and Justice, the United Nations Association Albuquerque Chapter, and Pache e Bene uh, Campaign Nonviolence. And this is not only on Peace Day, which is celebrated internationally on September 21st, but it's also part of the week-long actions of campaign nonviolence. And I believe there's over 300 actions this week. Uh, 325. Yeah, so that's pretty exciting. Um, specifically, I want to thank the Create Peace Project Committee. And so I'm going to read their names. Um, if you could please stand if you're able. Um, Sharon Halsey Hoover. Rosemary Blanchard. Maureen Wright. Susan Schulte, Halima Christie, Judith Kidd, and Molly and Sue. Uh, we helped a little bit, but we didn't go to all the meetings. So anyway, a round of applause for the Creating Peace Project Committee. <laughs> the only thing left I have to do is uh, announce what today is going to look like. We have a forum uh, from 4 to 5.45. And we hope you can stay for our Frito Pie uh, that's being uh, organized by Molly Wilkie and the Peace Cafe crew. Uh, Want to thank them. <laughs> and then at 6.30, we're going to have poetry by Mary Oishi and perhaps others. Uh, I'm not sure if, if there's going to be just Mary or some other people. And then finally, at 7.30, uh, for half an hour, we're going to have a candlelight vigil um, outside. And I think there's going to be a little bit of music with that, some flute, I believe. So stay for as many of the activities as you can. want to welcome the students that are here. Thank you for coming. Hope you come back. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think that is it. I'll make a pitch for our T-shirts and our bumper stickers at the back table. I'm wearing one. Um, and then also, we do have a yard sale on Saturday from 9 to 3, so come back for that, for that if you want. So thank you very much, and now Rosemary Blanchard will take over uh, who's running the forum. Rosemary. I'm short, so this will work perfectly. See? Improvi improvising always helps. Okay, my name is Rosemary Blanchard, and I am the chair of the Albuquerque chapter of the United Nations Association. And for those of you who are students, age 25 and under, you should know that you can join the United Nations Association for free. We have some information here, but it also leads you to the website because some people feel feel better joining things on websites than they do with paper. So we're hoping that some of you will decide not necessarily to get involved in all the things that we try to do here in Albuquerque, but get yourself connected with the United Nations Association USA, and then we will hear about you too, just to find out some of the international and national youth programs that they have to try to connect you with the rest of the world that we are a part of through the United Nations, which uh, includes, at this counting, 193 nations. So it's just one pitch to get out there and find the world. The International Day of Peace was established in 1981 by the United Nations General Assembly. The first peace day was observed in 1982. The United Nations invites all nations and people to honor cessation of hostilities during the day. In other words, 
They ask, they hope, the whole world to just lay down your arms for a day. Believe it or not, there were times when they did. This does not seem to be a good year for that. But uh, there were times when they did, and there will be times again. And the theme this year is Partnerships for Peace and Dignity for All, to, to highlight the importance of all segments of our society in bringing about peace within ourselves, at our community level, our national level, and globally. And as I was getting ready for this panel, I thought, well, peace. People like me and people older than me, we old peace ladies and old peace guys, we come out and we say peace, and everybody's very polite to us, they defer to our age. And then people who are struggling with issues in their community go out and struggle in their community against things like police violence, against homeless uh, tent cities being moved around, around, and torn up. And sometimes they, and people internationally, people in Gaza sit waiting for the next bomb to come down on their recently rebuilt house or school. And they hear the little old peace ladies are saying, peace, peace, what does that have to do with us? And so I thought the International Day of Peace is the day to look at that very issue. What does peacefulness, what does nonviolence, including nonviolent direct action, have to do with the struggle for justice, domestically and worldwide? Are they two different activities? that don't really have that much to do with each other? Does one get in the way of the other one? Or are we seeking for, are we building a society that can end its oppressions through the respect for every human being that expresses itself in nonviolence? And I don't know. Our speakers are going to give us their insights on this. And then you are going to share with other people who are here your own ideas, your own insights, your own thoughts about this, your own commitments. I hope everybody picked up a colored card that says peace is possible. If you didn't, you can go back there and get one. Because uh, after our panel, we will ask you to find your uh, kindred spirits with the same colored card and talk to them about a few issues and then report back to us so that you are in fact a part of this forum, not just an audience. Now, who's up here at our forum? Our first speaker will be Dr. Jamal Martin. He is the director of the Peace and Justice Studies Program at the University of New Mexico. He has conducted interdisciplinary research and taught and practiced in local, national, and global settings in health, medicine, and international health. As an African-American diaspora scholar and public health science practitioner, he has moved from studying chronic disease and infectious disease to uh, looking at the psychosocial and epidemiology of, of the disease in the world. In other words, how does, I'll let him explain it more, but how do the patterns in disease reflect our political patterns, our social patterns, our economic patterns? It's not just why did Ebola happen where it did and why did it take us so long to care about it? It wasn't until it might come and get us that we seemed to notice it at all. So I will let, uh, let him tell you further about this. Our next speaker will be Albino Garcia, Jr. He is the ex executive director and the founder of the La Placita Institute, which is a nonprofit grassroots organization that was founded by him in 2004 and engaging New Mexico's youth, elders, and communities in comprehensive, holistic, and a cultural approach to healing. It's designed around the philosophy of La Cultura Cura, or Culture Heals and it engages New Mexico's youth and elders and communities to draw from their own roots and their own histories and express their own values in coming to healing in their own lives and control of their own lives. And Dr. Tom Ayena 
is a community and organizational psychiatrist, psychologist. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Psych that right. Yes, I know, psychologist. Yeah, no, he does not. He, I don't do meds. You don't do meds, yeah, but do you do the American Psychological Association? That's a rather interesting range. Let's not go there. We won't go there. <laughs> hey, I, 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 I won't go there either. <laughs> anyway. And he is a social justice advocate, which certainly puts him at the odds with the, uh, <laughs> with the APA there. Okay, and he has instructed within the Peace and Justice Studies program and in the area of restorative justice, both restorative justice on campuses and restorative justice in the larger community. He recently uh, wrote a very, a very interesting opinion piece in the Albuquerque Journal about the need for restorative justice in healing and bringing back together the Albuquerque Public School District. And tell me that place doesn't need a little restoration. <laughs> so with those introductions, I'm gonna let our panelists do their own talking. And I ask you to hear them, listen to them from the perspective of what am I prepared to do? Where do I stand, or where would I put myself in a continuum from nonviolence to whatever means necessary in the struggle for social justice? And be honest, especially with yourself. Peace and blessings, everyone. Good afternoon, and thank you for uh, joining us on this auspicious occasion to celebrate um, Peace Day. And I wish this was every day of the year rather than one day of a year, but uh, that's our task and one of our duties is to raise the consciousness of others so that we can continue to have this discourse so that we can have, have you know, peace, justice, and dignity. Um, I'm usually a shy person when I got the microphone now, so I'm probably gonna run my mouth for quite a bit, but I'm going to try to answer first some of the questions that Rosemary was kindly to, um, to uh, say about my, uh, my background. Um, my training as an epidemiologist. Um, my training as an epidemiologist means that I'm a person who looks at the causes and distribution of diseases in populations across the globe. And as a public health scientist, um, because I'm in public health and global health, the basis of that is social justice. Um, but before I go on with that, let me say a little bit more about epidemiology and what that means. As I, as I talk about the, the causes and distribution and, and, distri and the uh, determinants of disease in populations, Early in my career, I started out just sort of looking like most young people, dealing with infectious diseases. Uh, from that, as I began to learn and grow and kind of think about other things, I moved from infectious diseases to chronic diseases, which is the second revolution of public health. And right now, public health is in its third revolution, which is something that's called the social determinants of health. And I don't know how many of you have ever actually heard that term, the social determinants of health. But what we, when we look at uh, what we call social determinants of health, we're talking about um, where you live, work, play, and go to school has an impact on your life and your well-being. So place and geography matter in that, in that sense. It's very important to understand that. And so as, as I began to look at this notion of the social determinants of health, my dissertation research was really in the area of um, social cognitive behavioral sciences and looking at what happens to the brains of children who've experienced trauma and violence and what happens to their brains. And later on, over the last 10 years, my, my, my work and my studies has moved from um, violence at the individual level to structural violence, looking at systems that are in place. And one of the things that I have to say about that is, as I look at this, I realize that over the last 500 years of, of, his, of history, we have systems that are in place which are not harmonious for health and children and other living things. And, those and, and, and I often tell the medical students that we can't treat people with pills and medicine and put them back into socially toxic environments. So when I look at this notion, I, I'm really at the point where I'm really looking for root causes of things. Um, and part of that, part of my work over those years has been the primary prevention of psychopathology and realizing that if I'm going to prevent psychopathology in individuals, you know, I have to start looking at systems and institutions and cultures. And so uh, that's moving to this notion of, of extending that, that idea much further. Because um, as I moved into this notion of, of peace and violence, uh, I'm a child of the 60s also too, and I remember many of the marches and all the things that we did during the 60s, and I have very fond memories of a lot of the, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm 62. I'm 62 and hope to get another 62 years out of this somehow. Because um, there's still so much to do in that sense, I have to stay healthy. But be this as it may, um, I, I like to look at root causes. And, and so in looking at these root causes, um, that's one of the things that has led me to education um, and moving away from all the other things that I was involved in and how people are educated because we have a system that continues to miseducate and misinform people. And so um, looking at this notion, one of the things that I always tell the students is that um, when you're in my classes, I want you to explore how to use your metacognition, how you think about thinking while thinking to improve your thinking. 
And I think that's, that's really key. I mean, and, and, and with that, I also go through a period of, of, of teaching students how to work with critical thinking and creative thinking. Because we often tell students to be critical thinkers, but we don't show them how to do it. Because one of the things that I've noticed in my life and my career is that the problems that we're talking about are so complex, they can't be solved just with one discipline alone. We have to look at the, this intersections of disciplines and how they intersect and what are the, what are the gaps of knowledge that exist in between those systems uh, and how we use that, that stream of consciousness to form a new set of tools in order to deal with these complex problems. Again, um, I see some of my students in here, so they know this is kind of redundant to them, but it's worth repeating again also too. If I give you a microscope, the only thing you can see is something that is infinite, infinitely small. If I give you a telescope, you can see things at a greater distance. What I'm proposing is that we give students and others a macroscope so they see the breadth and depth of these larger issues and how they intersect and how they interact and how we have to look at psychology, sociology, anthropology, all these things and look at those intersections and figure out how do we use them in an integrative way to kind of solve these problems. So that's, that's one of the things that I do as we talk about this justice. Now getting to this notion of primary prevention of psychopathology, um, that's one of the ways I see that I'm trying to, you know, work with this new program that I have now, which is Peace and Justice Studies, and that is the development of peace, strategic peace-building educational skills. And that is, you know, uh, how do we go about this by arranging, um, setting up a program and a pedagogy that's culturally sensitive and appropriate for helping students and learners and community members as well, because we're going to open up our certificate program to community members also, too. So, and how do we do this so that they actually have the applied skills to use in these very difficult situations. Um, as, we, as we continue to talk about this notion of education, it's, it's one of the things that I don't know if the situation can be reformed because it's been designed to do exactly what it's been doing for 500 years. So we need to set up parallel structures to compete against it. Um, you know, often when we talk about peace and we ask people to uh, <clears throat> define what peace is, it's very difficult for some people to define, but one simple way of saying it is that um, we know it by its absence. And by stating that, we know that everything around us, for the most part, is inharmonious with life and living, uh, with the environment, with ourselves, the houses, the spaces we live in. And so um, the individual change is while we have to develop our own metacognition, our own metaphysical sense of the world in terms of understanding the ultimate realities. And you know, um, we also have to apply that in unique ways. And so the other things that I sort of talk about in the classes and the work is that marking the difference between philosophy and science. Both science and philosophy from this perspective of education says that we are searching for the truth. And they use similar methodologies to search for the truth. But the difference is, science says, how do you explain it? Philosophy says, how do you apply the knowledge? And that's what I want students to understand through the program. How do you apply this knowledge to make a difference? Because you know, it's not going to change overnight. But the essence of this is building hope. Hope for the future, and hope for tomorrow, and hope for the for future generations and children. So um, there's probably a lot more to say about all of this. But um, again, I, I, when I look at the root causes, to me, it gets back down in terms of you know um, something that Martin Luther King said during the 60s, during the 70s, the issues of racism, materialism, and militarism, you know, and and so when we look at when we take on those issues, at some point we have to realize that some people don't like the term or idea of being involved in politics, but you have to get involved in politics, you know, by looking at that definition by who gets what, how, when, where, and why. And when I was a master's student, my dean always told us, I don't care what you learn about biostatistics, epidemiology, anything else. This is all politics. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to be dirty and play in the game, but you need to understand how it works in order to leverage those things that we need in order to have healthy communities and healthy societies. Um, again, there's, there's so much here to kind of say and kind of talk about in terms of outcomes and things, but I will say this. As, as, I, as I talk about those social determinants of health and the things that continue to breed the structural violence, um, one of the things that I see is that um, we, we have a system, again, that does not address the finer points of that. You know, as we talk about this notion of embodiment, um, you know, those of you who have heard of social determinants again, and, and how many of you have ever seen this film called Unnatural Causes? A couple of you know, well, a couple of you have seen it, so you know what I'm referring to then. It gets back to this notion again that, you know, we have, we have a, a mechanism in the educational system that has everyone believing that people are biologically defective or deficient. So therefore, you're, you know, your problem is in your genes, and that's not the case. It's your environment. Mm -hmm. Again, it's, it's where we live, work, play, and go to school that has impact on our health. And you don't have to be a genius to figure this out. You can walk around town, you can go up to Tanawan or you can go to different places around Albuquerque and town, and you can see the cultural differences, you can see the structures, you know, you can see the stresses that people are under, and those microaggressions that they have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And the day-to-day -day dealing of, of, of dealing with those microaggressions usually is what deals, you know, um, it you, you become stressed out. You know, we all have to have a little bit of stress in our lives, but I would recommend that we have some use stress, some good stress, uh, because the distress is what's killing us. There's, it's the build of those chronic stresses, the chronic stresses of dealing with homelessness, poverty, hunger, food insecurity, not having safe neighborhoods to walk around in, 
the environments in which we live, the structures that we live in. It, 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 it produces, the body produces more cortisol, it produces more epinephrine, um, which causes you to act, you know, to either fight or run away, or, or disassociate and freeze and do nothing. And the idea is how do we get people to, to move out of that, that notion of that learned helplessness and get to the point where they can work for restorative justice or, you know, or transitional justice or transitional justice, transformative pieces that have impact on our communities. How am I doing for time, by the way? You're doing okay for time. Okay, am I going too fast, folks? Because I'm, I'm sorry, I'm an ex-New Yorker. I haven't lived in New York for 40 years, but I still. <laughs> That's why I can understand you. I grew up in Connecticut. We, we can listen to New Yorkers. <laughs> <laughs> Although I'm an old Southern boy at heart. Um, but as I continue to look at my work and I expand my own knowledge and my own growth, um, I've always been interested in this notion of um, epistemology. I always talk about philosophy, uh, this notion of the metaphysics issues, uh, the ultimate reality, as we did with morality and other types of issues, the issues of um, epistemology, the study of knowledge, axiology, the study of values, and then logic. And I'm, I'm about to do a, a, a shift right now because I've been thinking about this for some time now. And while I'm always talking about the production of knowledge, who controls it and how it's used, um, I'm really starting to think now that over the next few weeks I'm going to explore this notion of the epistemology of the state of ignorance, you know, uh, because I think it's ignorance that, that, you know, and fear that guides so much of this. In fact, another little favorite aphorism of mine is that I tell the students that while we are dealing with these issues in a social context of, 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 of race, uh, which is a biological myth, it's a social political construct, uh, but racism is a reality, um, we know that um, at some point, these issues are not so much about color, but our, our main enemies are fear, doubt, ignorance, and superstition. Let me repeat that. Our main enemies are fear, doubt, ignorance, and superstition, which is why it's getting people to challenge their metacognition. And the only way we can establish a, you know, a bulwark against that is to have people establish truth, justice, mercy, and compassion. You know, and as we continue to work on those three things, truth, justice, mercy, and compassion, we weed away and we eradicate the whole notions of fear, doubt, ignorance, and superstition. And it's a, and it's a remarkable thing about the brain because the brain has this notion of, of plasticity. And every time we learn something new, our brain starts to grow and develop new cells and architecture and structures to support that learning. Um, and the old stuff sort of prunes away if it's not used. So the idea, again, if we can establish this notion of, of, of establishing peace and justice, because we can't have peace without establishing justice and fairness. Um, um, the other day, I was uh, kind of a sidebar story. I was kind of watching um, a recent movie that came out with Russell Crowe as Noah. And I can, Russell Crowe as Noah? Okay, how, you know, how's this going to work, you know? But the takeaway message from that was really an important one because they brought up this old issue of uh, the first fratricide, Cain killing Abel, you know, over issues. And as I began to think about this, you know, and I, and I looked at and I, and I thought about what they were saying, that what we have today is, is still going on, that mark of Cain in the sense that you have a group of folks who are dedicated to rapid industrialization at all costs, destruction of the environment, destroying, consuming all resources, wanton killing of animals, doing all kinds of crazy things, without having respect for the earth. And that says something to me in, in this notion of, 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 of that metaphor. And so it's another way of kind of using that tools to educate as well and things. So um, again, by any means necessary, you come up with any tool that you can or any device that you can to have that, that, that moment with folks when you are able to speak to their cognitive dissonance and get them to and have that aha moment like, oh, I get it, that teachable moment. And, and, and that's really a critical thing as we, as we move forward with this and, and we continue to work with partners and community members and all those are dedicated to peace, justice, you know, honor and dignity for all human beings and not just some. So there's a lot of undoing to do, but I, I really feel that education is one of the primary ways to do that. Um, but sometimes I think we need to start our own school and, and move away from all the other stuff. But it's important also too that we need to do this, we need to start earlier. Um, the African-American um, um, patriot Frederick Douglass once said that it's easier to fix broken children than it is broken adults. And so when we look at our systems of education things now, uh, we're, we're constantly feeding kids into this materialistic corporate model of school and education, even at the college level. And um, some things happened on campus the other day and I really sort of kind of blew up at, 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 the, at the leadership because I thought, you folks are making my job harder by the things that you're doing. You know, I'm trying to undo some of this nonsense and you folks are building upon it. And I don't think they see this. So I think that's why I'm changing my focus now to understanding, you know, how ignorance is produced and how people maintain it and how it's continually taught in many unique ways also too. So um, again, how am I doing for time? Kinda, now you're kind of running out. Okay, <laughs> I'll, stop for, I'll stop there for now and I'll give the podium to my, my illustrious colleagues. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Jamal. And you know, I just want to mention one thing. There's a, as uh, Jamal, Dr. Uh, Martin was, Jamal's fine. Jamal's fine, okay, because Rosemary's fine. 
anyhow, was talking about the social structures that lead to ignorance. I was thinking of one of my favorite dead writers, <laughs> who was a German theologian during World War II, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And he, as he started out as a pacifist. And he ended up part of the plot to assassinate Hitler, and of course he got caught, he got assassinated. And as he was about to get locked up by the SS, he wrote this essay called After Ten Years to his friends, more or less saying, what have we been through this past ten years? What does it mean, if anything? And painfully honest, the only way you can be honest when you've been living in the face of hell and you're about to be picked up by the SS. So it wasn't one of his abstract writings, but it was asking deep, searing questions. And he said something about folly, because he had seen his colleagues, who were as educated as he was, lock-stepping behind the SS and buying, seeming to buy all that BS. How could they? And so he said, folly is not an intellectual or a psychological problem. It is a sociological phenomenon. We have social circumstances that guarantee the arising of folly, that reward folly, that make people fearful of honest thinking. And so to say, how could John Boehner act like maybe, maybe Barack Obama was born in Africa? He's too smart for that, stupid as he is. It isn't a question of how smart he is. It is the sociological dynamic that compels him in public to speak like a fool. And we need to look, but we need to look at that because we're in that same social environment. So I think it's powerful to realize intellect will not save us. And that's what, that's what I'm taking from what uh, Jamal is saying. And now I'm gonna turn this over to uh, Albino Garcia who has been working with uh, communities that are trying to restore themselves and individuals who are unwilling to accept the collective social definition that they go under. And they're saying, no, that's not okay. That is not my life, that is not my children's life. And I love that, so <laughs> I'm gonna turn it over to you. I am Albino and Cosca Quauli, the Colored Eagle. I'm Mesoamerican and Apache. And um, I uh, um, live here in the South Valley of Albuquerque, as mentioned. And um, today uh, we're talking um, on the International Day of Peace and Justice. And um, when I met with Rosemary, um, we shared many stories. Um, and uh, one of them in particular, um, I thought was, um, uh, you know, a good one to share with you today. Um, I um, was invited uh, some years back to go with um, um, Dr. Michael Morris, uh, who was running at the time the Center for uh, Community Learning Public Service here out of U, uh, UNM. And my wife and I were invited to go with them to Belfast, Ireland, and um, with uh, students as community representatives practicing um, and trying to live um, and heal uh, from the American injustice system. And some of our practices, uh, most of them, actually all of them, uh, have a foundation um, an indigenous uh, foundation. And many people today uh, say that um, 
uh, referred to restorative justice uh, at its origin being an in, in indigenous uh, origin. Um, I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what they say. All I know is I was invited to go to Belfast, Ireland. And when I was there, um, we uh, visited people on both sides of the wall. And um, Protestants and Catholics, multi-generations. And we saw um, incredible pain that still exists. And we saw uh, incredible hope um, uh, that uh, they, you know, the, 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 they continue to use as a motivation. Um, I was asked to go uh, privately to speak with 18 men, nine Protestants and nine Catholic, otherwise known as loyalists and nationalists, and loyalists loyal to the monarchy still, nationalists um, identifying as you know nationalists of Ireland, and. Um, I walked into a room, and um, like this, there was this side, uh, all the men were Catholic. And then on this side, all the men were Protestant. And when I walked in, um, you know, it was like walking into, uh, you know, an area that I've been to in Soledad prison, and, uh, the feeling, the energy, you know, I've been in San Quentin prison. I've done work there with, you know, uh, uh, members of the Mexican mafia, the Nuestra Familia, the Black Guerrilla Family, Aryan Brotherhood, etc. Bloods, Crips, uh, North Norteño Sureño, rival gangs. I've done that for um, going on 30 years and working on the streets and many places where rivals come together in a room, and that's what it felt like. And when I went in, you know, I came up and I introduced myself with my language as I did just now. At first, when I walked in, it was, you know, uh, more of a uh, men looking on the other side, and they were very. Um, I could see in my subcultural language that they were sizing each other up, and they were looking at each other as uh, uh, memories, kind of as soldiers you know, uh, historical soldiers. And I could, they could pay no mind to me at all. I was just another speaker coming from the other side of the water. But I got up there and I introduced myself in my language and I got their attention a little bit. But then they went right back to focusing on each other. Um, after that, I asked for permission, which I'm going to do right now with all of you, because I'm going to address you if you give me permission um, in a very direct and sometimes uh, not so pleasant language, but it is the language that is real where I come from and where I still live and, and work, um, the subcultural language, in order for you to see and hear and understand exactly clearly what it is that um, uh, we deal with on a daily basis. So if I may hear from your voice uh, and get that permission, all you have to do is say yes. 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 Anyone opposing? Okay. I did that with those men. And then I went and I said, before we talk about restorative justice and practice, I need to get something off my chest. Um, I understand that you over here are Catholic and you over here are Protestant. Um, for me, where I come from, uh, Mesoamerica on my father's side, the conquistadores came and uh, many generations ago to meet my grandmothers and grandfathers. And when they came, um, they came with extreme violence and prejudice. They raped my grandmothers, and they killed my grandfathers. 
by the thousands. And when the Protestants came to where it was known as the United States now, to where my grandmothers and grandfathers on the Apache side, they came as pilgrims preaching your belief system. And where they imposed their belief system and they killed and pillaged our way of life, today we still reap those um, tremendous uh, impact. And so I'm sitting here thinking, here you're Catholics, and here you are the Protestants, and I'm supposed to come and share ideas of how to create peace. My practices on healing and restorative justice, but deep down inside, if I'm honest with you, this is going on in my mind. So I wanted to clear the air. This voice is actually saying to me right now, it's questioning me, why? Why would you come all the way over here and help these, help these people Stop killing each other. Let them, let them die for what they did. That was going on in my mind. And I wanted to clear the air. And I told them, just at that moment, they looked at me, every man in that room. And for a split second, I did think, oh shit. But um, I told them, let me tell you why. Because even though it happened hundreds of years ago, today we suffer tremendously, even today. At this moment, right now, we are suffering. Because those who believe in your way still impose that upon my people and my, and my family, my community. But if I am going to be true, absolutely true, to my tradition and culture and the teachings of my grandmas and grandfathers who were slaughtered and killed and raped, they open their arms in a gesture of receiving and though that wasn't reciprocated, that's the way I'm supposed to be. We have a teaching, the Mayan, the Aztec, we call it in la quech. It means you are my other me, and I am your other you. And so today, I have to treat you like my other me. And so I take that voice aside and put all of my historical trauma and I'm going to put it aside. And I'm going to talk about healing. Healing. Because that's what I want for my people. And that's what I want for you. So, at that moment, one of the Catholic brothers stood up. He said to me, Brother, it's true what you say. You know that it was the Native American who saved the Irish people during the potato farming, he said. I didn't even know what he was talking about. I didn't go to school long enough to learn that, and that's the truth. I didn't know that moment in history, but it was a tribe in the United States that sent all the pennies and dollars that they could bring up together and sent it to Ireland during the potato famine. I learned that from an Irishman there in Belfast. He said, it's true. And he said, 
I wish to tell you that and ask for forgiveness for that that my ancestors did. And even though, uh, true, the, the Native American helped us, right? And not to be outdone, but the Protestant side stood up too. Little competition there. <laughs> he said, sir, it's true what my brother says here. Hey, that's my rough Irish accent. <laughs> he said, the truth is, um, we didn't reciprocate that. You know, we have had many, many people come and talk to us. Not long ago, Bishop Desmond Tutu came to speak to us. And before that, the great Mother Teresa came to speak to us. But no man has ever come here and spoken to us the way you have. No man, he said. And I didn't know if that was good or bad at that moment. He said, we too uh, appreciate um, history and we know that uh, our beliefs are imposed around the world. And we ask for forgiveness. And I told them, I didn't come all the way over here to offer you forgiveness. You see, where I come from, forgiveness is a foreign construct. It, it landed on Plymouth Rock. We don't, we give up the need. Our true way is that we don't have a need for forgiveness. If we harm something or someone, we get together and we agree on what justice and restorative justice is. And we simply don't repeat it again. But we don't carry it as sinners in a backpack until the day we die. We don't need that. That came from you all. So with all respect, we'll continue and speak of the work we do Personally, today, every day, I try to work not out of trauma, but it's not easy. I try not to work out of the resentment and the pain, not just of my ancestors, but of my own life and that of my family. To me, restored justice in our way it begins here. We're taught everything to look for direction and guidance this way visually, externally. But in a traditional way, the first direction is here inside of us. And then when we come out the womb of our mother, what does restorative justice look like in my own family, with my own brothers and sisters and children and companion. What does that look like? What does peace and healing look like there? And then when I walk out the front door of my home in the community, I think I'm getting the sign? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then, and then uh, when we leave our community and walk into the greater society, the institution, society made by the five-fingered beings, public systems, etc. Today, I try to practice true and authentic healing and restoration um, of others, but most of all, <laughs> restoration of myself. If we don't do it here, how good are we doing it with others? Is my time up? Okay, thank you. As you may have guessed, these are the gentlemen that uh, Albino met with in Ireland. 
I look at them and I see so many of my relatives. I am New England Irish. And the part of the story that I think... Excuse me? Hi, I'm Terry. The part of the story that that Alvino told me, too, is that these were lifers for what they had done to each other uh, in the trouble in Northern Ireland. And they had been released into the community on the condition that they would reform and would practice restorative justice. May I say something real quick? I know I don't want to go over my time. These were the men that were in the room. Mm -hmm. These men were all condemned to life in prison and were released in 1998 due to a peace accord. Now, the United Nations did not sanction this accord. They didn't agree with it. And today, as far as I know, Ireland, Northern Ireland, is the only nation where restorative justice is a national policy. A national policy. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to, now that we have introduced the subject of restorative justice, I'm going to introduce Tom Ayana, who uh, is a practitioner of that method and who has spent his life helping individuals and communities to restore their a healing relationship with each other. Thank you, Rosemary. Um, I want to I want to build on these themes that are already being introduced because I think they're I think they're really important. And the first one that I heard at the outset is this respect for all beings. And because my training as a community psychologist also includes eco psychology in a field called depth psychology, my restorative work comes out of the soul of justice, if you will. What does justice look like at that level, not just a practical level, uh, a constitutional type of it? So um, when we think of all beings, it's the two-legged, it's, it's the plant people, it's the rock people, it's the mineral people, and begin to begin to see all of this universe as animistic, alive, and uh, I, wanted to, I want to speak to that in addition to some of the work that I've been privileged to participate in uh, in the field of restorative justice. And, you know, my background is uh, I was a homicide investigator out of college in Newark, New Jersey, following the riots. Oh dear. <laughs> so I saw firsthand, uh, you know, what came after that. Uh, I was the first college-educated uh, investigator for the public defender system in Newark, New Jersey. Um, and I was mentored by uh, ex-police officers who were, uh, I'll just say it straight out, as racist as any human beings I'd ever met in my life. Yeah. And I lived in a city that was 92% black and Hispanic. And I began to get a sense of injustice and justice at that early point in my career, 22 years old, out of college, and finding myself in the midst of a, I don't even know how to describe it to you, but what I began to glean from this was to begin to see how inadequate the system was in terms of addressing issues of race. And, and, and we live in such extraordinary times right now. The fact that last week on Friday, there was a conference inside the White House on mass incarceration. Finally, this is getting on the table. Colleagues of mine and myself have worked on this area for 30 to 40 years. And to finally see some breakthrough uh, around this issue of uh, incarceration of people of color and what we have done to people of color. I, I've only been back in New Mexico a month. I'm coming off of a guest faculty 
gig out at Humboldt State where I was asked to design a post-Ferguson approach to justice. Uh, and so we worked on issues of community justice. Community justice, how many of you are familiar with the terminology, community justice, restorative justice? Everybody got a sense of it. Community justice, in a systemic sense, is you move justice out of the courthouse, you get it away from the lawyers, and you get it into the neighborhoods. You move it away from legalistic terminology. Restorative justice operates on a series of principles. The first thing is that uh, crime is more than just a breach of statutes. It's a violation of human relationship, and that's where the focus goes. The second thing is that violation creates obligations. And there are obligations to repair harm, not just simply to either figure out how to punish or rehabilitate, both of which certainly have a play in, in a criminal justice system. I would add uh, another piece, is that restorative justice need to be driven by the community, not by systems. And to move justice away from bureaucratic systems is really the work, I think it's so part and parcel of restorative justice. Mm -hmm. And where I learned this was really, I, I kind of fell into it, I have to be honest with you. I had no idea what I was doing back in the early 80s. Uh, when an attorney came to me with a client, his name was Olden Carr. This was, I lived in uh, a place called New Jersey at that point. I, you've heard of it? <laughs> Olden was a senior at uh, a local university. And Olden was driving drunk one night with his girlfriend, his, uh, his best friend, and, a, and the best friend's girlfriend in the car. Uh, they'd been drinking and driving in Pennsylvania, in the Pennsylvania border, rolled his car, wind up uh, the aftermath of this, he killed his best friend and his girlfriend. Uh, by the way, Olden was African American, his girlfriend was white. Anglo, we might say out here. Uh, and I was asked by this attorney, uh, he had read a piece that I'd wrote on restorative justice, not knowing, I'd had no practical experience around it. I'd read a little bit about it. He asked me to get involved in the case, and I said, to do what? He says, well, my client, who is you know, uh, facing 20 years in prison for a double fatality, uh, he, uh, he's just been let out of a mental institution because he attempted suicide after this event. He was placed in the mental institution, was just returned out on bail to the community. And I had no idea what he was expecting to do. And I said, the first thing we need to do is talk to the families of the two youth that he was responsible for, whose lives he was responsible for taking. And so I, you know, tried to approach uh, the father of the girlfriend. By the way, the, fa the girlfriend was white, and the father who I spoke to wanted nothing to do with it. Uh, and I later learned that as a parent, he felt so responsible because he had forbidden her daughter, his daughter, to see Olden because of race. And his take on it was, if he had been a better parent, his daughter would have never been in the car that night. And he just could not bring himself to do anything other than follow the court system. The other family, the young man, who was also white, uh, invited me into their home one night in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. And I walked in, they said, well, we're interested in hearing what you had to say. I walked in and I was greeted by a, a, a group of about 20 people. Aunts, uncles, surviving siblings, ministers, mothers against drunk driving, you name it, they were in that room that night. And they looked at me and said, what are you doing here? And I could do nothing, I couldn't say anything, but I actually just listen, listen to the grief pouring through these people. And as they spoke, uh, the anger, I mean, there were all the state. those of you who know the Kubler-Ross stages of death and dying, you see the grief pouring through them. 
and one of the, uh, at the end of about an hour, the father of the young man who died looked at his community and said, our son was drunk that night too. It could have easily been him behind the wheel of that car and your client could be dead right now. And he brought the spirit of his son into the room by saying, we all knew Michael. What would Michael want if he had a voice in this process? So here he was invoking, you know, the voice of his deceased son. And out of that, they created a plan, which is nothing I could have ever done. The community is wise beyond measure if we ask the right questions. If we ask the wrong questions, usually what we get are retribution, vengeance, in restorative justice, we're looking at repairing harm. We're looking at restoring balance in the community. And we're looking for, to help offending parties make different choices in the future. Uh, where we got started with this in New Mexico about 15 years ago, we didn't start with shoplifting and property crimes and kids, you know, kids graffitiing walls. The first case that came to me there was a DUI fatality involving a young man, very similar to what I just described, where a girl from Taos Pueblo was killed on the bypass in Taos. And one of the more interesting pieces of this restorative circle, we use a model called sentencing circles in Taos, where we bring the systems people in with the community most impacted by an event like this. And they, the job of the system is to listen, and to listen from here, from the corazón not from up here, is to listen, be open. I can't tell you the number of times in these types of cases that we've had police officers in the circle that they spoke of the times that they drove drunk. And by the grace of God, nothing happened. In this particular case, one of the more interesting things coming out of the evening was one of the youth in the car who survived the crash was in the circle, a young woman, she was 16 years old. And when the police officer, the first responder on the scene spoke, he looks over at this young girl, 16 years old, April was her name, and said, April, when I arrived in the bypass that night and knelt down next to your body as you laid in the middle of it, I put my hand on, my pul on, on your, I couldn't get a pulse from you and I thought we had lost you. And this young woman just sat and wept. And when, you know, when she had had her tears, she looked over at the officer and said, I'm not used to cops talking to me that way in this town. So there's a point in the process called breaking bread, which I understand we'll do later in the form of Frito pies. <laughs> And what does she do? She went right over to the police officer and began to engage him. And this is the kind of healing that goes on between not just offenders and victims, but really we begin to see it in all aspects of the community itself. There was a couple in that particular circle. And picture, this was a circle of about 20 to 25 people, as I recall talking, it goes on for hours. There was a couple in the circle who had stopped at the accident scene and were trying to give first aid. They were the first people to actually arrive. They weren't first responders. But they came to the circle and talked about how much a part of a community they felt that night. And I think that's really what we're suffering from right now through most of our justice practices. We lose our sense of community. We lose our sense of humanity. And it's through these practices. And we're now using these. One of my interests that both the speakers have talked about to this point is I'm really looking at ways in which my research now is beginning to look at using this in uh, transgenerational trauma that has been spoken to already, of which New Mexico has an enormous amount of. Uh, my dissertation work looked at, well, dissertation was entitled uh, 
remembering and forgetting colonization in New Mexico. And I focused it on a particular place. And now we're beginning to look at how trauma transmits across generations. And if you don't deal with it, not to worry. Your kids will deal with it. Mm -hmm. And if they don't deal with it, their kids will deal with it. It doesn't, the historical pieces don't dissipate because we don't talk about them. Right. And I'm, I'm really curious about the ways in which landscape holds trauma. I just took 30 of my students down to the Bosque Redondo Memorial where the Navajo and Mescalero Apache people had been interned back in the 19th century, which was comparable to genocide. When you lose somewhere between a fifth and a third of your people, as the Navajo people did, hard to call it anything less than that. Mm -hmm. And turned my students loose on the landscape using a model called Terra Psychology, T-E-R-R-A where we listen into the earth. We listen and we pay attention. We know this, a little bit of the history. And what they came out with and the performance art that they were able to create. And there were Mescalero and Navajo youth there that day as well. And quite frankly, they, they, they could care less about what I had to say. But they were really interested in the Mescalero kids and the stories from their ancestors. And they were interested in the drumming and the songs that were passed to them. And these are pieces that I think are so important, the role of ritual, the role of creativity in transforming trauma. Mm -hmm. And a lot of my restorative work now, it's not unusual to walk into a circle where there's been a fatality, and the mother of a young man who was killed by, in a gang shooting brings a dream in that her son came to her the night before, and everybody leans in and listens to the dream time. And we're taken to a place that's so far beyond what we know justice to be. And there is a building of relationship through these narratives, through these stories. The, one of the things about restorative justice, most important for me, it is embodied. You can't sit in a circle with bodies next to each other what it moves us away from is just this concept of justice from the neck up. Restorative justice is an extremely bodied, embodied experience. And as I said earlier, oftentimes the community comes up with ideas. It's the community that wants to know how do we repair the harm. What's the role of community as a shared responsibility? And I'm thinking about the situation with APD at this point. One of my big concerns, I have to be real upfront with you, without any acknowledgement of the transgressions, how do you do reform? No one has even admitted, accepted, no city official, no police official has ever acknowledged the harm. They don't know the harm let alone the taking of responsibility for it. And for me, that makes police reform, police transformation extremely difficult without that public recognition. And I think it's what the community needs. The community needs to hear narratives. And they also need to understand the context in which all this happens. It's really important. One of my clients right now, you may know the case because her dash cam video went viral up in Taos of mm -hmm. the uh, African-American woman, uh, Oriana Farrell, whose car was shot at by s state police. We need to understand the context. We're working on a restorative justice approach in that case. We need to understand the context in which everything happened. And in the courtroom, it will never, ever come out because the lawyers do not want it in there. It is not relevant. And so we need to create vessels, we need to create containers where truth can come out, but also where there's hope as well. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Wow.
Well, this has been this has been quite a panel to be the MC of. This has been a <laughs> powerful group of people here. I'm going to, as we are a little bit past the time that I was hoping we were going to be at, but I'm glad we are because we heard the stories, and we need those stories. And I hope it cooked up some stories in your own thinking. I'm going to very briefly tell you that when Albino told me the story of, Northern, of the people he met in Northern Ireland, I thought of a very brief, brief story of my own, of something unresolved in the Irish American people. Because I'm Irish American and I heard of the troubles and everything. But one time I was reading a story about, at the time of the Great Hunger in Ireland, the trains of wheat, all the best Irish land had been taken over by the British and they were growing wheat for export. And so there were train loads of wheat going out of Ireland as the people were starving. And they were protected by the British military to shoot the starving peasants if they tried to rush the train and get the grain. And all of a sudden I started to get angry with an anger that was that was not of my generation. It was suddenly, it came up in, in me. And I felt like the adult who couldn't feed his or her family watching that train go by, who couldn't rush it because the soldiers were there and had to let it go and had to repress that anger so that they wouldn't get killed and ended up in the United States. And I started seeing uh, my Uncle Tommy, my Uncle Ted, you know, my Uncle John, various relatives, my Aunt Ellen, with an anger in them that frankly would come out when they had a snootful, when they'd had a bit to drink, they would get angry. And you would think, where did that come from? They didn't have anything that bad happen in their lives. And I realized the anger had gotten ahistorical and disembodied. That was that old anger that had not been resolved. And it had been passed on. They didn't necessarily know where it came from, but they knew that feeling. They had grown up with that feeling. And when the inhibitions were off, that feeling would come out. And I realized, wow, this is what happens to oppression that goes inward and then has to, and then is passed on from generation to generation without the story of where it came from, without knowing where it came from. So now I'm going to give you about, uh, I'm going to give you about 10 minutes to ask the panel questions, and I'm going to ask you to, also to gather by your little colored cards, so, because I'm going to want you to talk to each other. And we have some, it, it, uh, there's some questions that we put on your chairs. If somebody could hand me one copy of them, then I can remember what they were. <laughs> I wrote them, so I should remember. That's it, yes. Uh, thank you. I have a, whoa, that's loud. I have okay. A mic, I have a mic for anybody that has a question. Okay. So start with your questions, and then when you gather, we will, uh, we will ask you to ask each other some questions. We have a question right here. Okay. Given the genocides of this last century, I'm afraid of a completely passive military in the US. I'm utterly opposed to preventive war, but I want to stop genocides even if it means militarily. What do you think? And am I a pacifist? We must eliminate the bomb so we can save Syria and Rwanda, et cetera, et cetera, without total fear of annihilation. And along with this are maybe our alliances maybe just a bad bad idea because then they make us afraid of a total world war. You're all looking at you. <laughs> Well, actually, you know, what I would like you to do again, I mean, I appreciate your commentary. There's a lot of power and, 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 and wisdom seeking in that. But um, what, in order for me to answer your question, I think I need a little bit more precision just to really sort of give you a proper response because there's so much in that that I need to unpack. So would you mind just kind of moving past the commentary for a moment and just really giving me the question? 
Would you prefer I talk about the commentary? Well, I don't want us to, you know, I wouldn't want our government to suddenly decide we're totally isolationist, and I wouldn't want them to decide just that we're isolationist militarily, as long as we have these r genocides going on. So, well, the question is, it, does that make me, does that mean I'm not a pacifist? Um, and am I in the wrong some way? Th that is a question I think we all are dealing with in many ways. Um, as I've taken on this approach myself, um, I question as to whether I'm a pacifist or not. And quite frankly, I don't have an answer for that right now, but I do know that I don't want to commit violence, and I don't want to commit oppression. And so that's one of the things that I always strive to do is to question myself and my own motives in terms of you know, how I respond. And, um, and if I think I'm going to respond in a way that's going to create oppression, um, then that's problematic. And, and let me explain what, how I define oppression also, too. Um, oppression, for me, really is, you know, if, we, if, we, if we would map out a formula, it is supremacist ideology versus discriminatory acts plus structural dominance. And for me, that equals oppression. Now, the structural su the supremacist ideology part is this whole notion that people have been taught to believe that they're better than somebody else because of their culture, their religion, their, their pigmentocracy, or whatever the case may be. And I think that's a, that's the main thing we have to kind of sort of understand. You know, um, you know, this whole notion that's inculcated and embedded in our culture that we are better than someone else based upon their phenotype or their skin type of hair color or their race, religion, creed, or, or what it may be. But that leads to discriminatory acts. And then you have structural things, institutions that become institutionalized, that become part of that process, that maintain that status quo. Um, y your question is something that I've been thinking about in another sense, because in the next few weeks, I'm going to give an, a, a talk on peacekeeping versus peace building. And I think I'd rather see peace building rather than peacekeeping. Um, when I look at our, our military budget, and don't, and don't get me wrong, I grew up in a very militaristic place in Virginia, uh, one of the largest naval bases in the world. Um, you know, and um, um, our military budget is 560 something billion dollars. You know, we spend more money than 15 other countries. The only country that close, comes close to us is mainland China, where they spend 128 billion. Um, a fraction of the money could reduce so much structural violence. And so when we talk about genocide, I think maybe, you know, I, I think that's one of the questions I was thinking about. You know, we tend to think of genocide as just this one on one ethnic, ethnic group versus ethnic group. But to tell you the truth, I think so much of what we're talking about in terms of structural violence is genocide already. It's genocide against the people in this country. Sometimes I think using the military for mercenary forces is genocide and human sacrifice. Um, you know, so it comes down to language and metaphors. Um, something that Albino was saying in terms of language. The language you use informs your own way of thinking, and it becomes part of your culture also, too. And so this whole notion of American exceptionalism is very problematic in, in that sense. You know, and it's, and it's based upon this whole notion of manifest destiny that we were better than someone else, that therefore we should have all the lands that we set foot on and have conquered and, co and conquest. Um, you know, so that becomes, that's the issue of power, property, and how that turns into the notion of production and distribution of, of, of the resources that are in that particular area. So the genocide question is really um, a really critical one, but I, c quite frankly, I think the mass incarceration, I think the homelessness, I think the poverty, all those are forms of genocide as far as I'm concerned. And so it's, it's a matter of changing our metaphors and our language and how we think about things. Um, I don't know if that helps or not, but, um, you know, um, it, for me, it's, it's about, you know, I, I was talking to a student the other day, and she said she loved the debate. And I said, okay, but debate doesn't really solve anything. We need dialogue. You know, when you have a debate, there's always two people trying to outdo one another to compete at each other in terms of ideology or problem. You know, we need discourse, honest and open, truthful conversation about those issues. And this is where the reconciliation and the issues of restorative justice and respect for all human beings and all life comes into place. But we aren't at, we aren't in that particular place just yet. Um, and so um, it's important to keep having those conversations. And, you know, um, when we talked about New York and Philadelphia and things coming out of the 60s, you know, as we talk about participatory democracy, I'm reminded of, of a comment that one of my fraternity brothers said about the, the ignorance of our politicians is only surpassed by those who voted for them. <laughs> I'm going to ask you, Alvina, you were, you were reaching for the mic. Well, no, that's, I, I don't want to keep going with, say, I see, I see other hands up and go. Oh, okay. We'll start with you in the we'll next start one. start with you then. Oh, no, yeah, yeah, whatever. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, it's, it's not quite a question. It's just an impression. I feel that it, it's quite difficult for me to support fighting genocide somewhere else 
when we've yet to address the genocide that we in this country are guilty of and without making reparations and repentance for that, um, that genocide and oppression and racism. I think that uh, I'm not necessarily advocating um, isolationism, but I am talking about removing the uh, log from my eye before I remove the speck from my brother's eye. Just, just, just add to that thought very quickly. Um, that gets back to something that was said before about the acknowledgement of ignorance. You know, we have to acknowledge our own ignorance and, and, and surpass that to get to that point. So is there a restorative justice approach to immigration? Are there peaceful solutions in sight? Let's get them all out. Let's keep throwing them out. Let's get these issues, because you're going to seed these groups with these okay. questions, too. So give us several questions, and give the panel will respond to each of them. Hi, I know else wants to respond to it, just respond to it. Hi, I know there's a lot of, like, we have all these, like, really big ideas of how to, like, change things in the world in terms of restorative justice, but what are skills, habits, or like changes in our daily lives that can help us promote uh, restorative justice locally and within our own communities? <laughs> I'm also curious, um, relating off their two questions, about how we can have restorative justice model when it comes to um, our post 9-11 Islamophobia within our country and how to approach that with our peers and um, the people around us. So I was just wondering if there's any sort of restorative justice approach in the um, Albuquerque and New Mexico education system and how that would play out if there was. Okay, so I have a question as to like, um, whenever you have internalized not only racism but internalized like oppression and, and self, or I should say like, for example, like in my family there's a lot of um, pain and a lot of anger for what has happened to not only our people, but who that's happened to our family and individually us and our family. And I just had a question as to, you know, how can you approach that when they don't wanna, they don't even wanna turn around and ask other systems or other community or anything for help because of what the community has done to us already? Mm -hmm. Great question. Mm -hmm. You still want more? You got two more. Um, hi. I was thinking about a question about how you engage the oppressor mm -hmm. in the process. Who's responsible for listening? Who's responsible for being accountable first? So in the situation with APD, if they won't listen, there's a lot of victim blaming that goes on. So who's responsible for the process? Um, and how do you engage? And how do we as white people then also be accountable in that process? Um, I grew up in Virginia, I think just like you. You grew up in Norfolk? Mm -hmm. I was in Fauquier, a little bit north. Um, my question is, I've, I've had a lot of discussions with my friend having lived in Virginia, very uh, backwoods country kind of thing. Everybody has like eight guns at home. And I've tried to have discussions. People, people are very, you know, struck by 9/11 every year, and they talk about it a lot, and they think it's a really powerful thing, and that it was such a tragedy for us to experience. And I try to have a dialogue with them about the things we did to Japan uh, with Hiroshima and Nagasaki, or the things that we did to the Japanese when we put them in camps, you know, as a country. And I, and it, it sort of gets suppressed because of this American exceptionalism, and that American lives matter more than other lives. Um, my question is, how do you recommend to engage in those conversations with people that might not otherwise be open to discussing uh, our own faults as, as a society in that sort of thing? Okay, panel. I think... Oh, our, our oh. You got another one? <laughs> I'm always running late. <laughs> um, so one of the biggest critiques of transitional justice is that it could actually make violence worse. So my question was, do we see these same critiques in restorative justice policies? 
Okay, panel, let's start with Albino and Tom. Well, well there's so much here. Okay. <laughs> I'm hoping that these get some airtime in these groups because the answers are not up at the front of the table, quite frankly. <laughs> yeah, I don't want that responsibility. Yeah. Okay, let's then, let's get in groups. You okay, then get in your groups by color and ask yourself some questions. Okay. Get get in, get your get into your groups by color. Find your same color. Okay. Orange, green, yellow, pink. Orange, green, yellow, pink. I decided. <laughs> To create dialogue. Yeah. So, uh, like I said, can you just go around and sure. tell, um, <laughs> since I guess I didn't say anything, uh, oh, yeah. I, I came about to be here because I'm, I'm a volunteer here. Um, Thursdays I go with my grandma and mom, bring her around here, she works here. Um, we pick up food at Whole Foods and bring her here and do a cafe. And Saturdays we hand out donations. And, um, I was doing a lot around here. I moved actually to Albuquerque a month ago. I, I probably not. I'm going to start with group. Sure, sure. Can I have everybody's attention? I'm go. We're, I'm going to walk around with this mic. I'm going to wobble around. Okay. I'm. All right. <laughs> Anyhow, I'm going to uh, walk around with this mic, so you don't need to leave your groups. But I'm going to ask each group to report out one or two first steps that arose out of your meeting and talking with each other in the context of this panel. So I'm going to start with Group Orange. And Sue will be writing down what your group has come up with. Hello. So um, what we had. So we kind of had a theme, a theme of, of listening and a theme of, um, of homelessness. And some of the things that we jotted down, that just some of the stuff that we got to discuss was, you know, um, learning to listen as a community and having no judgment whether the color of your skin, what language you speak, just, just learning and listening to people whenever they're talking. Learning how to reflect on the communication that you use towards other people and making it interactive, and also finding the motivation to to talk to someone and and care about them and to listen to them without like having any ties, just to listen. Also recognizing that you know trauma trauma is painful and, and trauma exists, and that community can be a solution for that. A community can community heals. And for people who are, who are impacted by trauma, having that community can, can be all that much more. Um, we also discussed the desire to, to make our community humanized 
um, to create a culture that is about humanizing not only the, our, our community but also like talking with one of with one another despite our backgrounds. We also discussed that like in, in many areas there's there's not there's so much violence that are going on in, in, in some areas and there's not those positive role models. And you know, it's, it's important to have those role models so that we can create change because there's plenty of room for that positive change. Um, one of the things that we also talked about is the importance of, of our community members, whether that's young or older, it, it doesn't matter. Um, all of everyone is, in, is important and that we should recognize that because our community really heals. Our community has the potential to be the solution for, I mean, most of our problems. So just recognizing that and, and learning how to put that into our daily lives is really important. Thank you. Okay, this was Orange. Thank you very much, Group Orange. Group Orange, is this, is this Orange? I know, but is this, is the mic working? Ah, now there's a green light. Okay. Well, yep, we do. <laughs> I am Billigana, which is a sort of white, and that's the middle part of the Irish flag. So I'm going next to group green, and we will have done the flag of Ireland here. <laughs> okay, group green. Several, several of the people here in this group uh, talked about uh, reparations and, and racism, and help me. First admitting our, our problem. Yeah, it's a 500-year problem. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, the, uh, we asked for the names of books, and uh, one of the, one of the uh, people here recommended, I don't know your name, The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. The, bar, the, the, the Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. Uh, another book that was recommended was Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States. Mm -hmm. And then uh, and, uh, a Palestinian Walk mm -hmm. was recommended. Anybody else? I think she made a good point as to when it comes to rep I mean, that there's a good point made by uh, Fellow group member here about uh, re uh, reparations, which is uh, which uh, which authority gets to decide uh, who gets uh, you know who who gets the rep reparations in certain conflicts. Good questions. Anybody else, Anybody else out of uh, the green part of the Irish flag? Okay. Well, I guess the thing is like um, people need to be able to handle the truth, however bad it is, uh, throw out the sacred cows, not make it like one side's always the bad guy usually. I think she pointed out like, usually like both groups do bad things or more. So it's like, you know, if you can't handle the truth, then that's the first step and just forget it. The fat lady's already sung, so you're not going to get anywhere. Uh, a young lady here mentioned that she thought we were protecting the youth far too much from the truth. And in, in for me, that means, you know, we have to really work on our textbooks. It's called lying by omission. Mm -hmm. I recommend working on textbooks, which I've done professionally, is you don't even want to know. But alternatives to textbooks are available online and without cost. And one of the insurrectional things we can do is we can supplement the textbooks we can't get rid of. And here is Group Yellow. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, basically, um, I was assigned the task of a recorder, so I'm going to try to report out as best as I can on these issues. Uh, initially, there was some uh, brief discourse on the talk of, uh, on the use of nonviolence. And from there, the group went into a discussion on the focus on um, placing focus on Albuquerque, as well as um, global issues. Um, 
there was a respect, there was a point that was brought up about how APD views the protest as violent, um, as violent, and how we need to create greater dialogue with, with, with many folks. So out of this comes this notion of um, having a respect for each other and realizing that we come from the same spiritual thread. And then importantly, um, the important role of family and family development and education in these issues and how people become activists. Uh, but overall, there was a, overall, the overall thing was a dedication to peace at large and the difficulties in finding balance in between working and helping broken, uh, broken individuals and communities um, under this whole notion of cultural and historical trauma uh, that has um, come down upon us through U.S. policies and practices. And what are those, um, and what type of operations or devices are needed to help individuals and family communities to um, move beyond all that? The, the next question was, was a dialogue on, on a fur further dialogue on U.S. practices and policies. Um, and how do we engage um, people in the U.S. You know, with, uh, about the, the notion of crimes committed against humanity? Um, the idea was to engage with, continue to engage with like-minded people, continue to build a critical mass of supported, um, concerned citizens, and acknowledge um, um, the harms that have been publicly done in the people's name and, and listening and moving forward um, through local, state, and national to the global level. Does that make sense, folks? Uh, something that came to mind, building on uh, someone over there was talking about education and improving our textbooks. Um, growing up in Virginia, it's a very red state, and you know, it's very, everybody there loves the Civil War. Um, and it wasn't until I went online in the 10th grade that I learned about the Trail of Tears because it wasn't mentioned in the textbooks. It wasn't mentioned by the teachers. Nobody wanted to talk about it. So until, until I was, what, 16 years old, I had no idea about the Trail of Tears because of the lack of education and the lack of quality in the education that we have there. And I think it's really important to try and improve that and make people aware of the things that we've done as a, as a nation. Can I say one thing about, one other thing about the textbooks? Um, a few years ago, I served as um, commissioner for Bill Richardson and textbook review committee for the state of New Mexico. And we were charged with the task of making sure that all books had some multicultural content. Unfortunately, there's administrative law in New Mexico that says that textbooks cannot have more than 10% multicultural content. What? Yeah, it was a little by it was a little, 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 little blurb. And I thought, well, we're hamstrung here. because. So you have to change the administrative law so the textbooks have more than 10% multicultural context if we want to get the truth out. And remember, most of the textbooks are written and developed in Texas. That's, that's why I highly recommend finding your online uh, curricular resources. Those of you who are teachers, learn the standards so you can subvert them. That's what I've been doing for years. You can be standards aligned with the wildest and crazy and relevant and real things that are available for free online. A K-12 human rights curriculum. Anybody wants to know about it, ask me later. I know. on a variety of subjects. It has all kinds of films and video and anything that's in the public domain is available on there. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, this is group Pink. <laughs> that always used to mean you were a socialist when I was young. <laughs> now I think that's gotten lost. I just want to voice my gratitude for being here. I was raised in Salt Lake City and I ran away when I was 17 and where I wanted to come was here. Now I know why. <laughs> I, I am so grateful to be in a place where we can speak like this and people are so, uh, have so much integrity in, in what they're speaking and how they're speaking. So I'll just quickly go. I was, I'm a compulsive note taker so I took the notes so I get <laughs> to read the notes. One of the things we talked about first was, first of all, using our metacognition to look at ourselves and to recognize our own prejudice. That's something we can each do every day. And uh, then we talked about our sense of powerless, powerlessness that sometimes overcomes us, the power of fear and uh, 
if we feel intimidated, we feel that we have no sense of power. And then, and then we talked about being able to name that vulnerability and that fear because then we can see it in everyone and we can be honest with everyone about our sense of fear and vulnerability and powerlessness. And if we give voice to our, our truth and our vulnerability, then we begin to humanize ourselves and others will begin to show their true self to us. And we talked about this power coming from the community because a circle, a circle means everyone is equal in power. And we do need a group to be able to do this open and to create this openness and, and then the power of the people will rise. <laughs> and uh, we can recognize ourselves in others and this can, it can be very liberating to reach out and to accept others as they are. Thank you, Circles. Thank you, panel. All of you who are here, there is a sign-in sheet, which I hope you will sign in, because if we want to keep this conversation going, we need to know how to stay in conversation with each other. So if you didn't, if you didn't sign on and you want to talk about this some more, please do. Now, I'll invite the panel. Yeah, I want the panel to come back up front here. Besides panel, I refilled your water glasses, so there's a very good reason to come up front. <laughs> yeah, 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 I would. That's up to them. Okay. I want to thank uh, Jamal Martin, Albino Garcia, Tom Ayana, for giving us an outstanding uh, panel introduction to the hard work we have ahead of us. And I want to thank all of you who took the time to come here, who took the time to listen, and took the time and the uh, courage to engage with each other. Now, enjoy some Frito Pies, and let's keep the conversation going. We've got to. Follow to the people. May I say one more thing? Hello? Yes, got it. Hello? It's on. Is it on? Okay. Yep. So, uh, um, I, I always wonder about, you know, uh, days like this, seminars like this, gatherings like this, and um, what... I want to appreciate uh, this location, this this center, um, because um, we all talked about various things, and ultimately, you know, uh, we all have our opinions. I don't think necessarily any one institution or one group or whatever. I I don't want to give them the the easy way out, and saying that they they don't have an understanding, you don't have the knowledge um, as to what they do, etc. I I think they do. What we have is a, a mandated uh, state of uh, of ignorance. It's 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 almost mandatory. What we have is a lack of courage mm -hmm. in our police department. In, in in our in our policy makers and in our in our business community and 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 in every day of our life what we have is a lack of courage we really know we're intelligent beings and we know what the issue is we just need the courage to do something about it all of us and so um I applaud every one of you for being here tonight mm -hmm. and for showing the courage and all those who have facilitated this session and that will continue throughout the year. Let's not make this the only time of the year that we celebrate international peace, right? Mm -hmm. Let's Absolutely. do this. Thank you. Let's keep the conversation going. Now, do
we have? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And before, before you dig into the food, October 24th, which is the 70th anniversary of the United Nations, we are going to have a trick-or-treat for UNICEF costume party right here from 3 to 5. Bring your donations for UNICEF and maybe some potluck treats and your wildest costume. It's one week before Halloween. It's a great time to practice. Uh, yeah, the and UNICEF I forgot funds, to mention and invite all of you. Funds are going to the refugees from Syria, Libya, the ones we read about dying in the Mediterranean. That's uh, where the money will go. I also wanted to extend an invitation to all of you to 831 Isleta Boulevard tomorrow night. A dear friend and mentor of mine uh, who was featured uh, on A&E's Unsung Heroes because of his peace work in prisons and on the streets. Uh, all around the nation. His name is Daniel Nan Alejandres. He's flying in tomorrow, and he's speaking at our People Making a Change meeting tomorrow night at La Placita Institute. That's 831 Isleta Boulevard. Dinner is on at 530, and he starts, uh, he's going to have a, a talk with all of us, uh, open conversation around the same theme. So that's our way of carrying it on. Uh, so you're all welcome to come. Thank you. Thank you. And while we're making announcements, um, <laughs> I'd like to make one. Uh, in November, on November 5th and 6th, uh, there'll be uh, the general's son, Miko Pelad. He's the son of a general from the Israeli army. And he's going to talk about peace in Palestine and Israel and how that can, um, how that can happen. So I encourage you, and it's going to be at the Unitarian Church in, uh, it's Friday, November 6th in Albuquerque at the Unitarian Church. Miko Pelet, and he's a really powerful speaker. Uh, I <laughs> urge you to come.